they have to be commoditized in light of the uh, age-related industry, industry age-related illnesses, and this, uh, a higher senior population. The new wars we're fighting, still terrorism, okay? Um, industries impacted, insurance. We're still dealing with uh, security issues. I uh, just imagine the taxes you've paid for in a flight. Um, and reporting, and this has been uh, my mainstay presentation for many years now. Uh, human bias and saving face is still driving reporting. How many of you talk to auditors? Anyone talk to auditors? How many of you know an auditor? They're going through hell right now, absolute hell. Uh, what are they like? Are they losing their hair pretty quickly? Auditors in the U.S. actually have the highest divorce rate in the country by uh, trade because they're traveling all the time. Um, recent survey, uh, we already talked about that, but here's the best one. Auditors who bring up accounting issues and changes with management, they're refuted 40% of the time. They're basically saying, do as you're told, otherwise we're going to go to another auditor. What do you do then? You lose the client. Um, we're still going to have this. Once again, human nature, human psychology. Who's going to win with international reporting standards? The accountants. Why? Because you need one of those. They're going to be, um, when Sarbanes-Oxley came in, there was a shortage of accountants in the U.S. All of a sudden, you got a new set of rules. Whoever has the most amount of knowledge makes the most amount of money. Generality of rules. The rules are much more liberal. They're principle-based. They're not rule-based. And they'll negate global conformity that we desire. Um, I love conformity of rules. I would love to be able to compare a financial statement in Hong Kong to that of, let's say, the Czech Republic. But because of the flexibility within that, we're still going to have the same problem. Individuals have never learned and still have never learned, still, still have to learn what financial statements are. I think one of the senior folks in the U.S. basically said, um, in, in the accounting field, basically said, we're going to postpone uh, changing the rules on stock options because no one really reads it in the first place. They forgot that I actually read this stuff. I was fuming by postponing the rules on stock options. There are people like the CFA Institute that are pushing for um, more clarity in the financial statements. And, th and that's what we, they, we still have to win on. Um, what should we really do now for our profession and our career? Well, let's think about it from our perspective as CFA charter holders, as financial professionals. Rule number one, um, recessions are always going to take place. We always have known recessions are going to take place. When I gave a financial statement analysis speech in China, I was amazed to see the youth written on the audience. In Beijing, there were about 50 people in the audience, and all of them were less than the age of 35. They had never seen a recession. How many of you act in a role of a mentor? Raise your hand. Good. Keep it going. Some of the best teachers I ever had were mentors. The problem with mentors is sometimes they leave, and then the new generation of charter holders or financial professionals never get to hear the horror stories of, let's say, the Latin American credit crisis, okay, or uh, the financial crisis that took place in 1998. In China, because there's such a new batch of CFA charter holders, this is their first recession. I gave them the accounting financial Tom, Tom Foolery speech. Mm -hmm. I hope they remember something. My journalist crowd that I've given speeches to, they don't remember anything. Because the problem with journalists, and, and this is their problem that they even confess to, um, what was that phrase? Do never believe everything you read in the paper? How many of you have heard that phrase? We say it often in the US. But they're the first ones to admit that they don't have enough time to write their stories. They get a financial statement by 3 o'clock. They get the press release. By 5 o'clock, they have to write the paper. I don't think I can write a story in two hours before it goes to press. And that's the problem. Imagine that you have to be a risk manager first. And I think we forget that sometimes as the market goes up. We get complacent. If you know a mentor, if you're young, if you're less than 40, 
find a mentor that's like 60 or 70 that's in, seen at least three recessions, three massive horrible stories, and extract it out of them. Um, knowledge is power, that's why you're here. And we must pr practice voracious reading. I know we don't really have a continuing education requirement. We read a lot, obscenely. But I think we need to read a little bit more eclectically. Not just the paper, not just the news, because we have a symbiotic relationship with the journalist. The journalist reads our analyst report, and then we read the paper. So if there's one piece of bad garbage information that's filtering between the two reports, it's only going to filter. I think this financial crisis has gotten only worse because the media has not been fully educated. I think it's our responsibility as charter holders to teach the journalists because they represent our end user, our investors. And it's hard. It's hard for us analysts to make time. It's hard for the journalists to make time. Being a doomsayer must be balanced with being an optimist. It's very easy. I've, I've heard some speeches from other global forecasters where they make a lot of money on being a doomsayer. And their, their titles are very shocking. I don't think you can be a complete doomsayer. I think if you have to collect factoids and put them together like a jigsaw puzzle. And that's the way you work. I'll give you a good example of a, a really bad, uh, well, two sets of factoids I found out. About 30% of America is single, divorced, or widowed. 30%. And that number is only going higher. About 50% of them admitted that they were buying lottery tickets to save up for retirement. Go figure, pretty scary. But these are from two different articles, okay? So in other words, you've got to look at it from two different ways. We need to practice layman technology. How many of you love acronyms? We love our acronyms. EBITDA, cash, CFO, cash flow from operations. Our audience is the individual investor. How many of you feel complex that the people that you socialize with do not know what the CFA designation is? How many of you feel that? Yeah. We, we are a very elite crowd as a charter holder, as a finance professional. We control a lot of money, but no one really knows us. And if you really want to get a little respect, we have to convert our regular information that we deal with into layman's terms. Because the only reason why the market is moving with such volatility is because there is panic among our audience. They don't know enough. They want to put their money in the mattress. They don't trust us. I'm not talking about just investment bankers. They don't trust the buy side either. And we've got to work hard toward that. Financial crises could be avoided if we spend more time educating the public. What is really long term? What we're really showing off is big fonts, long words, and acronyms that sound really cool. It's really a nerd mindset. We need to be kind of more hip, I would say. Impact on investment analysis. Let's think about the future. If we're getting older, then bonds are going to be a very important asset class. Now let's talk about bonds for a second, because this thing, this thing is where the whole crisis started. We've been talking about the crisis. It's a common theme. I'll tell you very specifically where the crisis should have started. How many of you, talk, how many of you are bond traders? Anyone are bond traders? Awesome. When you're, quote, when you're a bond trader, I'm going to just ask you a blunt question, because I talk to bond traders all the time. Do you quote off-balance sheet debt to your customers?